stand and worship the Lord.
But we pray for your peace, your wisdom, Lord, and just help down here, Lord. We need your help. Father, we love you and we thank you. We say your name. Amen. Amen.
our time of corporate repentance, we remember that we have not humbled ourselves before the King. We'll be reading from Philippians chapter 2, the first 11 verses. I'm reading out of the English Standard Version. Philippians chapter 2. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from godly love, any participation in the Spirit, an affection, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and with one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interest of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours, in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped for his own advantage, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. You will pray with me. Oh, Father, we schedule a time of repentance because it does not come naturally to us. We admit that we have spoken words of repentance in times past and we have spoken them insincerely. We have sinned in every way. We have thought that our money absolves us of obedience. We have harbored cold hearts that we might have warm feet. We have pursued knowledge, but not that which builds up. We have pursued pleasure, but not that which lasts. We have said the burden of the Lord is light for us, but we create many hurdles to others' conversions. We have pursued victories, but only for ourselves and not for our brothers and sisters. We have clothed our bodies in honor and our souls in shame. We have let the light of the world languish, but we sit in luxury. We have insisted on our health, but took no care for the well-being of others. We have said that all men are created equal, but we have valued life based on location. And we have spent more time honoring the dead while dishonoring the living. We have been filled with fear of worldly things and presumed upon your grace. No sin has had been too low for our contemplation. We have rejoiced in rumors and rebellions, innuendos, and yet rejected the one seeking restoration. We have utterly failed to comprehend the depth and breadth of our sin. And Lord, if we, if we took all day, we could not begin to utter all the ways in which we have failed and all the ways in which we have sinned in, in our lives. And we know, Lord, from past experience, that this will continue to be the case as long as we tarry in this life and in this flesh we are prone to sin and prone to error. Oh Lord, have mercy on us. For the assurance of pardon, we'll be reading from 1 John, the first chapter of 1 John, starting in the fourth verse. The apostle says, and we are writing these things so that your joy may be complete. This is the message 
we have heard from Him and proclaim to you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Praise be to God for His blessing, for His cleansing, for His mercy. Let this be our prayer together as we stand. Lord, reign in me. <laughs> My name is Amr. I'm from Jordan. I moved uh, with my family to the uh, U.S. Me and my wife, uh, Victoria, was praying for the, um, the state and the cities that don't have Arabic church. After a long time praying, God said Cincinnati. We have a significant group of Arab-speaking people, so we've been praying for quite some time. God, would you give us someone that we can just kind of turn loose in that people group, right? And. Uh, Honor literally just called me out of the blue. There is not a lot of people know the culture, know their language, and can share the gospel with them. We came to reach our community, the whole Arab people, and now we have people from at least nine countries from the Arab world. God has brought honor here, and we're going to support him, we're going to encourage him, we're going to walk with him, and we're going to see God get glory among their people in Cincinnati. Today is on church planning. Um, in 1954, I believe it was, Calvary Baptist Church, uh, which was located downtown, uh, they identified the northeastern part of Evansville as an area that needed a new church or gospel preaching station. Um, the area was, the community was expanding out in this direction, so that was the year that they planted a what they called back then a mission or nowadays we would call it a church plant here at 1215 North Bakey Road where y'all are all a city and uh, in 19 uh, in the 1960s uh, Northeast Park was on the other end of that we identified an area out in Boonville that needed a uh, church plant and we planted the Southside Baptist Church then and then about 17 years ago now uh, we planted um, a church plant that we called Resurgence a Church, and then since then we'd even helped with a church start in Muncie called Remedy City Church. So church planting is very important, and it's important to remember that churches plant 
churches. Um, so we are going to uh, uh, be in prayer this morning for that, that God would just bless through church planning. Let, let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, Father, I pray that you would lead others uh, to be church planners. Uh, Father, I pray also that you would just guide and, and uh, call out core leadership in those uh, church plants, knowing that uh, any church is not going to grow just on the basis of one individual, but it takes a core. Uh, Father, I pray that, uh, uh, that you would just give boldness uh, to those that are involved uh, in those church plants, boldness in sharing the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ with others. Uh, Father, and I pray that, that your kingdom would grow through church planting. And in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Lord, I pray if I can add a little bit to that. One of the ways that we as a church participate in church planning is through our any Armstrong Easter offering. You know, one of the important things that for a church plant is that there is a godly leader that is planting the church. And sometimes it's hard work finding a person who really is qualified to be a church planter. And one of the things that happens uh, through the North American Mission Board is they assess individuals for their ability to plant a church. Now, it doesn't mean that it's perfect. Uh, we still have attempts that end up failing. And we have some people that we say, no, you shouldn't plant a church. They go and plant a church anyway, and it does a great job. So it's not perfect. But it's a very rigorous theological background of individuals to make sure that the people that we are supporting to plant churches know what they're talking about uh, and know the scriptures well and are able to teach others those scriptures. So I encourage you throughout now and throughout Easter uh, consider giving to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering because uh, people like you just saw, Amar, uh, while that church is mainly has a mother church, if you would, that they meet on their campus and they use their facilities, part of the way he is supported is through the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. That the money that we give goes to help give these people an income uh, that they may work amongst the group of people that don't have a lot of money to, to give offerings week after week and, and to start and work among those individuals. So uh, remember that as we continue going through Easter, our ability to reach out amongst North America uh, to spread the word of God. Will you pray with me this morning? Gracious Heavenly Father, I ask today that you would open our hearts and minds to receive what you have prepared for us. I pray, Lord, that we would be able to look into the scriptures, both Old Testament and New Testament, and within those pages, Lord, that we would see the truth. Father, I pray that you would hear the words of Jesus as he prayed for his disciples to sanctify us in the truth, Father, because your word is truth. So, Father, I ask that you would make us holy today. That you would guide our thoughts, that you would guide our attentions, and that you would speak to our hearts. For I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 If you would grab a Bible and join with me in the Gospel of John, the 19th chapter. We continue looking at the moments that occurred before uh, Jesus was crucified. As Pilate is still trying to figure out what to do with this man. Pilate has said on a number of occasions already to the crowd that he finds no guilt in Jesus. And yet the crowd is fighting back. John chapter 19, beginning in verse number 12. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and 
sat down on the judgment seat of the place called the stone pavement in an Aramaic Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and he went out, bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Gagatha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews. But rather, this man said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. Now, I must confess to you that it is rather awkward today to stand before you and talk to you about the importance of a king. Because I recognize that I am speaking to 21st century Americans. And our joint heritage together is that our ancestors, if you would, all got together to overthrow the power of a king. And when they were planning America, or America, wherever you're from, while we were planning this great experiment that we now live in, they made one thing for sure. We don't want a king. Because they'd seen the problem with kings. Especially a king that was way far away. But the problem with kings were they were more interested in themselves and growing their lands, growing their influence, growing their power and your money than they were interested in you. And so when they worked out a constitution Rather than having someone that would be an eternal king, they went with a temporary president. And they made sure, they said, look, let's only give him power for a few years and then take it away from him and make him earn it back. That way, at least, as long as he has to keep coming back to us for power, he's got to do things that we like or we get rid of. It's pretty smart, right? I mean, as long as I can keep the guy who's in charge pandering to me, that keeps me in a position of power, and that's a good thing. But as soon as I make him a king, as soon as I give him an ongoing power, bad things will happen. And that's not just here in America, in America's revolt against Britain. That's pretty much anywhere ever there's a king. And that's part of our human nature. In fact, it's so much so that when you go into the Old Testament, God knew. Now, of course, God's omniscient. God's all-knowing. He knows everything. But God knew that when he brought his people, these Israelites, his chosen people, and he pulled them out of slavery, when he gave them their own land of their own, of which they would dwell for and it would be their land forever, that they were going to cry for a king. That a day would come where they would say, you know what I think is a good idea? We need one person, one man to be over us that has full power over the whole area. That's a great idea. So God, knowing that that was going to come, God set up some regulations and he told them to Moses. So when that day came, at least they would go about that the right way. So in Deuteronomy chapter 17, God spoke to Moses and said, when you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, 
you may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. So here's the guideline. He set up two main guidelines. One, I choose the guy. And two, he's going to be a guy that's among you, among my chosen people, not someone from outside my chosen people. That's who the guy will be when that day comes. And so history moves forward for the Israelites. They do come to possess the promised land, and they're living there. And for the longest time, they're not calling for a king. They're having judges that come in. And, and the word judge, you know, it's kind of one of those interesting words. And, and that mindset, the judge was really a leader who would help deliver them from their trials. So the book of Judges, you see this cycle that happens over and over again. The people do bad things. They do whatever's right in their own eyes. So God gives them over to their enemies. And while they're there with their enemies, they start to cry out, Lord, save us. Sorry. So God raises up a leader. That leader delivers them from their enemies. All is well and good. And they do right until they start to do what's right in their own eyes. And they forget about God. And God sends them. And it happens over and over and over again. Judge after judge after judge. So they go to have somebody in charge, and nobody in charge. To somebody in charge, and nobody in charge. To somebody. It is this cycle that repeats on loop. Then God sends prophets to speak to them. If Samuel was the primary prophet, and things were going great, look, we don't, we don't have a, a deliverer, but we have somebody that's telling us God's word. He's relaying to us the information. And things are going great with Samuel. But Samuel, he gets old. And he does something that kind of reminiscent to what kings would do. He sets his sons to be the next people in charge. Only problem is his sons are awful. We'll get into the details of that. His sons are awful. And so the people, not liking who's in charge, Say something crazy. We want a king that's over us. Let's get a king that will make us like everybody else. Almost like God said that one day they would cry out. Because these Philistines were just pounding upon Israel. They were looking for a king that would come and protect them. That would keep them safe. Now, I'm going to read a large portion of Scripture. Some of you like to turn there. If you want to join with me for this, 1 Samuel chapter 8 is what I'm going to be reading from. I haven't forgotten about the Gospel of John, I promise. 1 Samuel chapter 8. I'm going to begin reading in verse number 7. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that they have done, from the day I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and some to plow his ground, and to reap his harvest, and to make his implements of war, and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, and cooks, and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards, and give them to his servants. 
He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, No! But there shall be a king over us, that we also may be like all of the nations, and that our king may judge us, and go out before us, and fight our battle. Samuel had heard all the words of the people. He repeated them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Obey their voice and give them a king. Isn't it strange how oftentimes when we see danger, when we feel our lives being threatened, we will cry out for any type of deliverance even if we know that that safety, if that salvation is going to come at an extraordinarily high price. Israel was just told, you're going to be made slaves because of your king. And they said, that sounds good to me because he'll protect me and keep me safe. Did you see how God sets all of this up? When Samuel's feeling hurt that the people aren't happy with him and his choices. God doesn't look and say, Samuel, I know that's really rough, buddy. I feel bad for you, man. God says, Samuel, it's not you that they rejected. It's me. People aren't trusting me for their protection. The people aren't trusting me for their salvation. The people are looking around them and saying, well, this is the way everybody else does it, so that's the way that we need to do it too. That's the way everybody else is made safe, so that's what we need to do also. Let's just follow the world's model. We don't need to trust in a God that we cannot see. And to their detriment, God said, <coughs> Okay, I'll give you what you want. One of the most dangerous things God can ever do is give us what we want. We need to be crying out daily, Lord, change my wants that I might want what I need. Amen. Amen. Instead, we start looking at the way that the world should be orchestrated for my well-being. And you would think, looking over the history of Israel, the, the chief priests and the Pharisees of Jesus' day should be able to say, you know what, we really need to be trusting God for our protection. We really need to be trusting Him for our safety. We need to make sure that we're only following the things that God is calling us to do, yet here we are in this account today, and the only one who seems to know that Jesus is the king of the Jews is the foreigner, Pilate. And the great irony of the way this is, in, in all of our translation, if, if you look at it, as Jesus comes out, there in verse 13, when Jesus heard the words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat. Here's a real funny, that fits the context and it makes the most sense that Pilate himself would sit on the judgment seat. That's his job. But John writes it in a, in a way, because Greek is funny, word order doesn't matter. You can move the Greek words around in all kinds of order because the endings of the words tell you what part of the sentence it is. Just, just trust me on that part. John writes this in a way that basically says, Pilate, Jesus came out, sat on the, on the judgment seat. It could be either Pilate or Jesus sat on the judgment seat. The Greek allows both readings. Context tells us it was probably Pilate. But it's possible as you're reading this 
the question that comes to your mind as you're trying to figure it out is, who's sitting on the judgment seat? Kind of like before we had the whole high priest situation and the, the wording and the way it was structured. Who's the high priest here? And the answer was Jesus. Once again, who's on the judgment seat? And while it may have been Pilate on that judgment seat, John wants you to understand he's not the one who really sits on the judgment seat. It's Christ and Christ alone who is the judge. But the problem is everybody in this account except for Jesus can't figure that out. And so Pilate is saying, this is your king. And all of Israel should have rejoiced at that news. All of Israel should have said, at last, the one that we've waited for, God has given to us. Everyone there should have seen the miracles that he's performed and how it points to the fact that he is the king. They should have seen that he fed 5,000 with just a few loaves of bread and fish and how that pointed to the great miracle of provision throughout the wilderness. They should have seen him raise a dead man back to life and realize who can do that but God. They should have seen that he gave sight to a man born blind. And no one has ever been heard of doing that before, but Jesus could do it. They should have seen that he had a goodness inside of him, that even though it was the Sabbath, and even though it was causing problems, Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath day, told him to get up, take up your bed, and walk. And, but yet all they could see was, how dare that man tell somebody to work on Sunday? Sabbath. They couldn't see God standing right there in front of them. All they could see is, I don't think that guy can keep me safe. I don't think that guy can overthrow the Romans, so let's get rid of him and find somebody else. They couldn't see that God had already chosen Jesus. They wanted to choose the guy they thought fit the bill. So, one of the most ironic Phrases you can possibly find. Verse 15, the crowd cries out, We have no king but Caesar. In a moment of hatred of Jesus Christ, they threw out the fundamental, foundational premise of their entire religious believe that we have no king, no God, but God. And they joined with all of the Roman world saying, Hail Caesar. We have no king but Caesar. Remember, God said, I will choose a king for you. And don't let it be a foreigner. And they said, I will choose someone and that foreigner looks good. And while I want to sit here and I want to point all the fingers at these Pharisees for just not seeing what was obvious and right in front of their face, I can't help but realize that we, us, 21st century Americans who love the fact that we overthrew a king a couple hundred years ago, sit here today trying to find a new king to take their place. Somewhere that we can put our protection in the hands of them. Let them take care of things and make sure that they look after all of my needs and make sure that my life is good. We see it every single day on the news. When people who cry out on Sunday, I trust Jesus and believe only in Him, will then declare the rest of the week, man, if we could just get the right guy in political office, everything would be okay. <laughs> and we may cry out, term limits, term limits, term limits, but we seem to keep electing the same people over and over and over and over again. Because that guy will keep me safe. And if you remember here in America, while in part of the issue was, you know, we didn't like the, there were some people that wanted to keep the king because you know what, the king was, had a big army, 
Did they like that? Some of them wanted to keep the king simply because they were loyal to the king. So much that they were called loyalists. We got to stay true to the king. And today in America, it's not a king we're loyal to, but it's the letter R or the letter D or the letter L or the letter I. Whoever has that letter, I'm loyal to him. That's the person that will get my vote. And what are all their policies? I don't know, but they've got the right platform. So I'm going, we give ourselves over to all of these political things. And while we're here, we're saying, I trust only Jesus. We live as if we trust only the government. Many of us need to lay down our trust that we've placed in the wrong place. And realize it doesn't matter who holds the mayoral office, and it doesn't matter who's in the president's office. We have a king already, and he will take care of us. Amen. But I know some of you are too holy to get into the whole politics thing. You know better than that. You're not worried about making a king out of a political leader. Because after all, I go to church. I know all the right answers to all of the right questions. I do the right things. I only dance where I'm supposed to dance, and that's nowhere, so I'm good. <laughs> the only things, the strongest thing I drink is a good cup of coffee. Can I have an amen? Amen. Coffee's nasty, huh? <laughs> and instead of putting our trust in a political leader, we put our trust in the religious system. If I go to enough services, if I attend enough studies, if I volunteer for enough positions, if I do the right kind of actions for my neighbor, if I do all of those things, then God will protect me. And the reason I know many of us fall into that trap is the moment things start to go wrong for us in our lives, we, we ask this question, what did I do wrong? Did I not do the right things? Have I, did, was the, I missed that one Sunday school, but the preacher said I was okay to miss that one, so I mean, that one got excused, right? I mean, so what did I do wrong? Did I not read enough this year? Last year I didn't make it through the Bible, so is, is God punishing? Why is God so mad at me? What have I done? To which if you've ever said that to me, you, you, you've heard this. What did Job do? He was righteous and it went wrong for him. You may not have done anything wrong, but you see, we trusted in the religious system that the religious system would protect me from having a rough life. And unfortunately, that's how we often try to sell Christianity. We put up billboards. Things going rough in your world? Try church. Oh! The church can't save you. It can only point you to the one who can. Man. But too often, we're more worried about the religious system than we are the one that it's supposed to point us to. But I know that some people, some of you right here, you're like, I don't fall for that. Fall for the church stuff? No, that's not my game. I can take care of myself. Now, I'm sure no one in here would ever say such a thing out loud, but how often do we live that way throughout the week? I got this. You need that done? I got that. I've got my financials all in order. I've taken care of all of that. I've got my household in order. I've taken care of all of that. I've got my nice calendar and schedule all in order. I've taken care of all of that. I've got this. You see, you haven't made a politician your king. You haven't made religion your king. You've made yourself the king. I trust me. I can handle it. And if that's where you're at, the first time with disease, the first time of bankruptcy, the first time you lose your job, the first time something goes wrong that you can't fix, 
you go into a tailspin. You see, each one of these have their own disasters because there's not a politician that can keep you safe. There's not a religion that their system will take care of all of your needs. And you're not strong enough to take care of yourself. There is only one, only one, who is able to truly protect you, who is able to truly save you, and when he came to earth, we murdered him. And while we did it, but we're not at that point in the passage, in the, in the book, while we murdered him, we mocked him and said, oh, you wanted to take care of us? You can't even take care of yourself. Come on down. And we ridiculed the king, not just of the Jews, but the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And let none of us sit here today and say, well, I wasn't there. Because I can tell you, apart from the grace of God opening your eyes in that moment, each and every one of us would have been one passing by looking at just another criminal on the cross and might have said, Wow, he said some really good things. It's a shame to see what he's going through. But the honesty is, most of us would be walking by going, Tch. it was a joke. But here today, we can say something different. Here today, we can look at Jesus Christ and see him crucified and recognize that it was for my sin that he died. While other kings want to steal my lands, want to steal my family, want to steal my life from me, that one died that I might inherit the promised land. That one died that I might have a true family. That one died that I might find my life. You see, what all of the kings of the world may take from us, Jesus died that we might have. The forgiveness of our sins. An eternal life that are bought by each drop of blood that was shed on the cross for you and for me. Amen. And here's the great thing about that king. Yes, he was murdered by our sin, but he was raised by God's power. Amen. And he reigns today, he will reign tomorrow, and there are no term limits on his Rain, and that Amen. will be good news for you and for me. Amen. Behold your king. Who do you choose? President? A religion? Yourself? Or will you choose Jesus Christ? Amen. Will you pray with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, I ask now that you would open our eyes to see Jesus Christ. For Father, whoever was seated on the judgment seat that day, we know that each and every one of us will one day sit, stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And he will see the way that we've lived our lives. And Father, it is our earnest desire to please our King, that he might say, well done, good and faithful servant. Thank you for the king who was slain for us. Who gave his life for ours instead of requiring our lives for his. Grant that we might trust him. Grant that we might believe him. For I pray all of this in his name. Amen. Amen. As we close out our service today and sing our, our final song, if you've been trusting in yourself or in some other system, that I would, as we sing this song, come and share that with me. I want to help you know that when you trust in Jesus Christ, there you will have your ultimate protection, your ultimate safety. For in Him we truly find our rest. Let's stand together as we sing.
politician. I'll take Jesus over any organization. I'll take Jesus over myself. Amen. Praise the Lord that I have been crucified with Christ. And it's not I who live now, but Christ who lives in me. Let's receive the benediction together as one thing. Almighty God, maker of heaven and earth, we thank you for sending us the King. Father, forgive us for our sins that forced him to be crucified on our behalf. But Father, each and every day, help us to bend our knee and our will to him, that we might serve the King. And now, Father, as we leave this place, guard our hearts and our minds by granting us your peace. Amen. Amen.